Welcome back to Spitball and Cards. In today's episode, we want to talk about the MLB debut patch autograph set. We also want to talk about Zips projections and if those can actually tell us what cards are going to be worth the most money. And on top of that, we want to talk about which grading company is our favorite besides PSA. Today, we have a little bit lighter group. We have Chris, Baseball Card Addict. We have Jeff, my favorite cardboard. And we have Phil Filmington. This group, in my opinion, we brought the, the big hitters. Sorry, Ty. Sorry, Producer Lance. They'll be here maybe in the second episode this week. If not, they'll be back next. The first topic we're going to discuss is going to be about Zips projections. And if you don't know what that is, that's a fan graph projection where they actually look in the offseason at the player's last few years and their age and try to predict what type of season that player is going to have. It takes into consideration war, defensive metrics, all of the offensive metrics, home runs, RBI. You get the big picture and it says which players are going to be best. I made a video on this this past week talking about you know, the top 10 overperformers and the top 10 underperformers of their projection and what their values were. And Phil wanted to share some thoughts. And so did uh, Chris and Jeff. And I want to hear what they have to think on it because I had my take, but I want to see if everybody here agrees or disagrees that these projections can be reliable in deciding what players to speculate on in the off season. So without further ado, I want to turn the time over to Phil. I want to hear your thoughts first, Phil, on what your thoughts are as you're speculating on players. Yeah, I think um, the, the the right approach if you're doing fantasy baseball where you're truly getting rewarded based on results and it's a, a one for one, right? Um, I think looking at projections makes sense if you create your own projections or if you're looking at fan graphs project, projections versus zips versus whatever other projection source you look at. There's probably 10 to 15 different types that are like really commonly used. Um, I think where it gets... A little difficult is in the hobby where you've got a lot of other people that are using the same projections. And like, I think that generally what these projection um, sources use is they'll use like the last three to five years worth of data. They'll wait, wait higher the more recent years. They'll adjust them based on ballpark, based on, okay, was he a rookie? Let's like take these numbers down. And they'll also look into some of the more advanced stats that you know kind of isolate away the luck and they'll try to kind of hone in on that so for pitchers it'll be fit versus era so i i think i think a lot of people do this already in the hobby so i think if you go down the rabbit hole of becoming obsessed with projections you might end up facing a situation where all of this is already baked into current prices future expectations based on that like, so uh, who's a guy that came in with really high expectations that didn't have like the actual numbers last year? Um, I think Freddie Freeman, right? Um, 20 or so home runs last year. Great hard hit data. So I'm guessing his Zips projections had him for at least 25 home runs. Um, and I think a lot of people expected that to come back. I know I did. So I think it, the, the challenge is you have to be right on the projections. We ask, you also have to be right that the projections and the actual numbers if they do translate, are enough to push that guy over the hump and to make that guy um, attractive uh, and, and and have that have those cards appreciate. So I think somebody like Kyle Tucker probably came in with a decent Zips projection, probably came close to hitting it, maybe not defensively, but offensively, he was probably right there. And did his cards go up or did he just not do enough because it's just Kyle Tucker? Ozzie Albies, another guy, absolutely killed it with his... I know he's a guy that you mentioned in your video, Scott. Yeah. exceeded his projection but did he do enough to become relevant in that kind of stacked lineup um and stacked kind of hobby with all the young talent right did he do enough to transcend that for his prices to go up like matt olson's did so matt olson benefited he probably beat his projection though by a lot right Talk so at the end of the day i mean the projections are going to be wrong it's just a matter of how much on which side right and you still have to do enough to be relevant in the hobby on top of that. If that makes sense. Totally does. And I, I want to pass this over to Chris, but I do want to show what these projections look like. And if you're listening on uh, Spotify, we are not going to like go too crazy. But just for those that want to see these, how to access them, all of that. So I'm going to share my screen really quick. So here is my screen. And it's not an infinity loop this time, which is great. Uh, if we actually see, if you just look up 2023 ZIPS, Z-I-P-S projections, this was the actual ZIPS projections. You can change it to any year you would like, and you can actually pick, you know, a whole bunch of different things. But regardless, 
these are the players that are projected to have the best season. We have Judge, Turner, Soto, Ramirez, Correa, and so forth. So in hindsight, it's easy to look at this and think, well, that was a dumb projection to have Correa there, but they're looking at a bunch of things and not just what we're seeing now in hindsight. For specific players, if you want to look at their three-year projections, here's Jose Ramirez's uh, Fangraphs page. We can scroll down not very far and you'll see Zip's three-year projections. This will go away sometime soon. Uh, it goes away in the offseason and it comes back at the very end of the offseason, right before the season starts with a new three-year projection with this year taken into consideration. Good thing about Zips is it does take age into consideration as well. So Mike Trout, as an example, might have had like a 10 or nine war season like he always does, but maybe he was heading into his age. This is not true. This is hypothetical. But 34 season is they might have regression baked into it based off of his age as well as his good stats. So, but like right here, I will say I do like Zips projections for someone who's speculating on Jose Ramirez making the Hall of Fame. Right. So let's just say, again, this is hypothetically 24, 25 and 26. We'll just say it's one year in the future. We can say 5, 10, 15 to 16 war. Add that to his career war, you know, 46 plus 16. We're looking at what is that? 62 war. That's a Hall of Fame career if you can just have those three years. And so you can kind of speculate there on the long term. But I do agree, Phil, a lot of people do this. So I'll stop sharing my screen. But I want to hear your thoughts, Chris. What do you think? Um yeah, my, my first thought is pretty much uh, what Phil was saying, that Zips projections aren't hard to find. They're out there. So, like, pretty much everyone in the hobby has access to them. They can see them. We can all see who's projected to do what. The hard part is to find someone who is not projected to take a big step forward, but who actually will. And Jeff and I did the opposite of this. We sold. Uh, we looked at, like, Guerrero's projections, and we're like, okay, you know, Zips likes this guy. You know, his 2022 wasn't, wasn't great, but he's hitting the ball hard. So we – um, we consolidated heading into the season. We ended up selling a bunch of Guerrero and buying like two bigger Guerreros. And then we watched obviously him fail to meet those projections and the values plummet. Um, so we're like, well, fewer of our cards went down in value, but <laughs> you know, it was just two really big ones, but they went down, you know, you know, quite a bit. It's hard to look at those projections and you want to try to find just like in fantasy, you're looking for the, you're looking for the guy that zips is going to overlook. And it's, it's really, really hard. I think you were just talking about, the, the players that outproduced their projection. The n number one, I think, was Acuna, right? Yep. I can talk about that in a moment. I can pull everybody up. But number one was Acuna. Right. And that's like, and that was, I think, the most predictable player to outperform uh, his zips because he had injuries baked into that. That made, you know, his numbers this year, what, what zip, zips was going to be really uh, conservative with what they had for Acuna. But I think that wasn't exactly something that was sneaking by a lot of people. So Acuna stuff, you know, that wasn't even a great example because a lot of his prices were already baked into him having a huge rebound. So it's tough. I mean, everyone looks at these zips. You've got to find the, the handful of players that zips thinks one thing and they're going to do a lot better. I don't know. Jeff, did you have someone like that this year? Well, I just, uh, to touch on what you just mentioned about Acuna. So he was number one because I think Scott, you said his, his predicted war was like a five war season, which is outstanding. And then he blew that out of the water. But even there, he 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 bypassed his zips projection by three and a half war, and his cards hardly moved the needle. So I don't know. I mean, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, like Chris mentioned, are Vlad, and I think that was that was the most disheartening part of Scott's video, seeing Vlad's war of one, one war. Yeah, which is incredible. So I'm interested in seeing what happens next year for Zips with a guy like Vlad. How do they? go uh, projecting him forward now based on his let's say his previous three years now he has one good one in there of three years and he's still young though so i'm interested i'm interested to see that the guys that really underperformed how that affects their zips projections for next year and like chris said we we're gonna try to look at guys that we think underperformed and so maybe zips is projecting a little less than we think they are we failed miserably this year with vlad but We'll see. Maybe we'll maybe we'll go with Vlad again in 2024. <laughs> I, I do want to say I predicted Acuna as one of my top three picks heading into this season. So that was lucky. I also picked DeGrom and Wander Franco. So for what it's worth, I was one for three and I was right about Acuna. But it's it's impossible. I will say it's almost impossible. I did the top 60 and only 12 players met or exceeded their projection at those top 60. 
And God, so sorry to interrupt. That's one thing I wanted to say yeah. about the video. That was the most surprising thing to me because I think you mentioned it in your video too, but everybody says that when they look at the projections at the beginning of the season, oh man, why is this so low? He's going to blow this away. And of your top 60, only 12% even, even exceeded it at all. So yeah, that was, that was really surprising to me. So maybe the, 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 the thought that zips under predicts is, is not really accurate. It's kind of a myth. Yeah, I agree. And I always thought they did too, but I, I'm, I'm in the same boat. Chris, you had a thought before I cut you off there. No, if I did, it drifted away. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so, so some of this might actually have to do with like the games played. So that might be a place where you have an edge because I think conservatively zips and other projection sources like ATC, BetX, they might be a little lower on games played for somebody like Acuna that's missed a lot of time recently. Again, looking at like the last three years, right? So maybe the reason why Acuna was only projected for five war is because the games played were like 140. And I could be off by that. So if if you are to make your own projections, you can take like all of the inputs from zips aside, aside from plate appearances, innings, um, whatever, you know, uh, games played. And then you could adjust that and then calculate like your own projections and they could end up being a little bit different. I know a few guys in my fantasy league will do that. So Phil... I already did the math while you were talking. He was projected to play 129 games, which is a five war projection. If you put that across 162 games, that's 6.2, 6.3. So that is a much more, you know, that's that what, if that was the case, if he would have been projected for 6.3 war, that would have put him as the fourth highest projection. So I guess if you're saying it that way, maybe that was already baked in, right? Into the pricing yeah. of Acuna. It's hard, and especially if it's, it, it almost seems like a fool's errand to predict games. I, I, I myself finally invested in Aaron Judge in a fantasy league based primarily on what he did last year, and <laughs> that didn't go well on a per game basis. He was great, but he wasn't. He wasn't there. He's kind of on the on the trout 120 game a season program. Yeah, I, I agree, and it's tough. All these projections are tough, but at the same time, I think there is hidden value in there for you to find and unlock. Like Phil and everybody said, just look for the ones that are overlooked because you might have someone who is projected for three war. It is kind of, it is a good gut check on what not just the baseball community, but the hobby feels about a player. And so like if you would have believed in it, let's look at the other top risers like a Matt Olson, who was projected at 4.6 and ended up with 6.7. You know, we had a huge increase in value from that 2.1 war difference. So if you had the the gut check, you know what, he's going to have a great season. It can really pay off, but the odds are against you. And that's and, why speculation so bad. <laughs> and I just want to say, I, I know one of your top guys is one of my, my favorite pickups from this year, William Contreras, uh, fantasy wise. But I think he, he exceeded, he was a top, I can't remember exactly yeah. where in your where in your standings he was, but he blew his, his projections out of the water, but it didn't move the needle at all in the hobby. So you have to, you have to find the guys that are going to exceed their projections and also make an impact. Like Phil had mentioned, Kyle Tucker, he's a great consistent fantasy player, uh, consistently puts up numbers, but just doesn't do it for whatever reason in the hobby. Yeah. So for Contreras, like you mentioned, the Brewers, Jeff, your Brewers are amazing. They know how to make a catcher an amazing catcher. That was his biggest thing when the Braves traded him is that he couldn't be a defensive catcher. And he was one of the best defensive catchers yeah. in baseball, which is amazing. That's great. You love to see players turn around like that. Uh, but he was projected for 2.2 war ended up with 5.4 war, which is 3.2 war difference, which is right behind Acuna for second place yeah. in all the baseball. So. Cool. Corbin Carroll is an interesting one because based on the team's running tendencies, I think rookies are very hard to project stolen bases. Very difficult. And, and then with the the um, the rule changes this year that I think people learned about right around like February. So I don't know if they like restated the projections for stolen bases. Maybe they did. But I'm pretty sure Carroll was projected at no more than like 32, 33 steals. We already knew that he was the fastest player in the game, you know, before Elliot Cruz, De La Cruz got called up. So it's like, in what universe would he not with his on base skills with his kind of his bat? I don't think people expected him to hit like 280 like he did this year. But how is he not going to steal at least 40 if he stayed healthy? Yeah. And he stole 50. So he about doubled his projections there. So there, there are some room for like inefficiencies and maybe Vlad's another one. Now we, we know that zips is wrong with Vlad. They de-emphasize launch angle, probably barrel rate too. So use a different source for Vlad going forward, not zips. Maybe that's another key. 
I'm very interested. We'll, we'll change topics now, but I'm very interested to see what these stolen base projections are going to be next year for Acuna and Corbin Carroll. They have to be huge. And I think it's going to impact a lot of players and it's going to mess some stuff up. And one thing I have to mention is a lot of this stuff is regressed to like league average. So even though it might say like a player might have X amount of whatever, it doesn't necessarily mean that his war is going to be significantly higher because war is based off of league averages. So just something to consider as well. Um, but yeah, so the next thing I want to talk about, probably I want to give Tops a huge round of applause. I'm not going to. Here's a small golf clap, Tops. But MLB debut patches, those came out and Tops blew it out of the water. Like all of our concerns about it being like a Chromium card, all of our concerns about being a sticker autograph, Tops released at least some images and they looked great. And they looked like they were already hand signed. That could have been just a really good graphic design job. But overall, I think they did a great job on the design. And I will pull that up right now. While I do so, I want to hear everybody's thoughts. Let's start with Jeff on this one. What were your what was your take when you first saw those MLB debut patch cards? I was relieved. I thought they did a great job. I, I, I believe we've talked about this before that they oversold it a little bit in the spring when they promised the announcement of of the generation when they were coming out and it, it was revealed that they're going to have players wear these. But besides that, I think they've done a great job with it. I know the checklist is a little big because there are a lot of players that made their debut this year. But it's going to be really exciting to see how the hobby embraces them, what the first ones that are pulled go for. I just think they did a great job. At, initially, when I saw the patch, it looked very small on the on the shoulder of the of the players, but it it was perfectly done because you can fit it on one card, one patch, one card. You don't need to cut it up, and it's a true one of one. So I think they did a great job. Chris, what do you think? Yeah, I think these these are probably like the the very best cards Tops is going to produce in 2023. Like they this is near perfection in terms of a card. Like it's finally a rookie card that can challenge. Like the the Bowman, the first Bowman Chrome Super Fractor, I think. Like these are just great. I'm hoping that some of the checklist is 91 cards, which is, I mean, it's a lot, but I mean, that's just great. That's more of these out there. They're all one of ones. I'm hoping some of these debut patches have grass stains or some dirt, maybe even like some pine tar on them. Give them a little uh, little character. But I mean, I think the the best hitters out there are uh, Matt McLean uh, from the from the Reds and Volpe on the Yankees. I mean, I'm sure Volpe is just gonna go to some like absolutely astronomical price jordan walker too will be expensive. Jordan walker yep and there's some really good pitcher autos in there too like uh yuri perez bobby miller grayson rodriguez they all have theirs it's kind of a shame that like michael harris and gunner and adley all debuted like last year so they don't have one in there but these cards look absolutely fantastic i find myself like complaining a lot and i i end up sounding more negative than i really want to about tops yeah. because they, they do infuriate me quite often but these things, I feel like they they nailed them. Like these look, these exceeded my expectations. Yeah, it's a it's a love and hate relationship with uh, the tops and fanatics. They piss us off one week and they give us something great the next week, and uh, <laughs> we're constantly talking out of both sides of our mouth. But hey, here, I mean, you got to give it to them. Uh, and I echo what you said, Chris. Like, if there's any challenger right now of the Bowman Chrome autograph one of one super fractor, it is this card. Um, it, it's a game used patch. Obviously, we know that it's an on-card autograph. The design is cool. It's classic. In the picture of the player, you can actually see the patch that he's wearing. Oh, I've, I've heard so. It's a nice little touch, so you know that that photograph was from that game. Makes it even more special. Um, it, rather than just having like a, a game matched sort of situation, you're, you're truly getting it from that game as well. So I mean, I mean, you look at Dynasty and you try to compare the two. There's one here, which makes it obviously very, very special. Unless in future years, they start to, you know, roll out the number to 25s, roll out the number to 50s. You've only got one patch. So unless you're going to... Maybe like, they're going to wear patches. patches. All over. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, pieces of patches at some point. I, I hope they don't screw this up. This is awesome. I do wish that Corbin Carroll and some of the other, like my favorite top three was, was Corbin, probably Gunner and Adley from this year. Um, and, and they didn't make it in, which is unfortunate, but, but I'll take it for sure. Um, you look at the image versus dynasty or, or the, the card, um, overall, and it's a vertical baseball card collectors, sports card collectors, for the most part, do prefer the vertical pose that actually gives it an edge over, even there are, I mean, there still are like between usually three to eight different dynasty one of one RPAs anyways, but being able to game match it. Um, a lot of people that I've been talking to, one guy I was talking to at a card show thinks that this 
might rival logo men like national treasures, one of one logo men and other sports. So it'll be interesting. You know, I, I think pretty soon we're going to understand the true power of brands like national treasures and flawless, because I know you guys don't do a whole lot of basketball and football, but Panini flawless is not game use. That's not game worn materials. Those are patches that mean nothing, right? Those are event worn patches for football and for basketball. For football, I'm almost positive national treasures RPAs are also not game used. That's so this crazy. has intrinsic above intrinsics above that. I know we're talking a different sport, maybe different demand, different target market, older generation of buyers, more collectors, but still. You've only got the National Treasures RPA out of basketball. That would be something that it could come up against in addition to Topps Dynasty. I think I like the choice that um, Topps did not put these in Topps Dynasty or a high-end set because I think they're doing a good job distributing the highest-end and most valuable, most sought-after cards across more products. So you're creating demand for more products. I don't know what that will do to like long-term resale value for the card the fact that it's coming out of tops chrome update but it's still a hobby product it still takes what eighty four thousand hobby packs in order to pull one so that's like what like three thousand hobby boxes it's gonna cost you a lot um i go back and i i talked about like how i thought the prices were out of whack pre-sale for tops chrome update i think 150 hobby 350 ish for jumbo um i still think they're a little high but in my opinion, I would spend probably $20 more for a hobby box, um, just knowing that I could hit, and I probably won't, one of these cards, even though the checklist is large and it's missing some of the top rookies. I will say is this has to make it interesting for wax hoarders like yourself, Phil, because then let's say the Volpe doesn't get pulled for a few years. That wax is going to go up. It will get pulled by a breaker. I think that's just inevitable at this point, just the way things feel like they're going. But there were a few things that you all mentioned that I want to talk about. The first one, can I just say baseball? For all the crap we give tops, they've done such a better job, in my opinion, than Panini and Fanat uh, Fanatics and Panini and all those other like products with Prism and sticker autographs on some of the most important rookie autographs and not game worn patches. Like Tops has done some really good stuff there. Much easier to get a game worn jersey from a baseball player because there's 162 games versus. Well, I don't know how many NFL games, 16, 18. I don't know how many it is now. Um, not a big NFL guy. But regardless, I do love that about baseball. I'm a baseball homer, so it is what it is. But the thing I want to bring up, let's have just like everybody's thoughts. First thing, I think if we said the Super Fractor one of one Bowman Chrome autograph or this, I think we'd all say Super Fractor. If you disagree, let me know. But I don't want to debate that too much. I want to debate more of like the red out of five or this, right? Um, what are our thoughts? Because the one thing I will say about the Super Fractor one of one versus this card is there's now multiple one of ones, while this will be the card forever. But this is also a rookie and there's tons of rookie sets. Like, what are your thoughts on that? If you could pick one, if we all agree Super Fractor, then we can compare it to the out of five true red if we want to. What are your thoughts? I'll let you go first, Phil. That's a tough one, man. I'll wait for the first auction. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, okay. I, uh, I, I would take this over the, uh, the Bowman Chrome red super fractor auto, not knowing any, not having any other information. It just seems like a more special card to me. Um, and you don't quite get that with just another color of Bowman Chrome autograph, even though sure. I'm a, I'm a Bowman guy. Sure. I, I kind of feel the same way. I think that's, what's always been special about rookie cards to me versus Bowman Chrome autographs is the fact that they're in their uniform. Generally, they've actually played a game. You know, the Julio short print from Series 2 last year was not a MLB game. That was Photoshopped. But the majority of the time, like, they're in a uniform. You know, they're in the big leagues and everything. I like that. Um, so that that is a great thing about these cards. Jeff or Chris, do you disagree? Or do you are you on the same page that you would always take this over the red? Uh, I'll be honest. I was I was thinking Bowman. I was thinking the, the red. Um but what Phil said is kind of swaying me a little bit. So it makes it tougher than I thought. I, I, I was going to say Bowman because of the history. Now that's it's, it is sort of the, the elite. Well, this is the elite prospect card, but it is also one of the most elite cards of the players. So to get a red out of five of that would be pretty special, but I don't, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it is, it's, it's a tough call. I, I would, I guess I would still go with the Bowman Chrome, but I, I could see either way on this one 
Okay, Chris, you're the deciding vote on this between uh, you three. God, it pains me to to have to to take Phil's side over Jeff, but I, I definitely I would I would take this card. Um, it's just the fact that the patch was physically on the player when they made their major league debut just makes it absolutely special. Um, and we talked about like that Bowman Superfractor being like the first one. I mean, this patch is the first one, and I cannot like the prices on these will probably exceed what we're expecting but when the jason dominguez one comes out next september in uh or yeah. whenever chrome update comes out i mean that card's going to be nuclear it's going to be really cool and i will say these generally look better than the bowman chrome prospect autos like look at the juan soto image where he's kind of making a face like this it doesn't look like, it doesn't even look like juan soto like i do think that will help these as well like it looks like anthony volpe right uh so yeah. I, I like that myself i would pick this card personally Oh, what are you showing, Phil? Oh, no, this looks like Evan Carter. But maybe it's because he still looks like a kid. Yeah, he's, he's still, he still the smallest like waist it. in baseball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he hasn't filled out yet. Hey, yeah, small I, waist, as long as you got a good eye, it's okay if you can walk. I will uh, say but, that uh, we, we are putting a bit more trust into tops if we are picking this MLB debut patch card because they could roll out not quite something like this or parallels of this card, but other stuff that's kind of similar. With you other think. players. And then what Jeff's saying, you don't have the history, you don't have the legacy, you don't have... And then it also, like, Dominguez, we're going to have to wait a long time before we get, like, a really high sale because all the great rookies, you know, are missing the checklist, right? So we want that, right, that that one-of-one one Mike Trout Canary, you know, update card. We need, like, examples like that. And then people are going to want to kind of come in and, you know, because you're setting the market there versus, like, setting it with Volpe. Guy kind of sucks. Like he might be in AAA next year again. Uh, but Jordan Walker could also be in AAA next year, but he's a little bit better right now, right? Jordan Walker can learn to play defense. His numbers will look great. That's his <laughs> issue. Uh, do we know? Have they said going forward that they're going to keep this as a as a Chrome update product? Do we know that? Or That's are they my put concern. Another product? Too, That's the risk. Yeah. That's a real concern I have too. Because if this goes to Dynasty, then it's not as attractive to me. I think one of the beauties of this card is I feel like it's more like the golden ticket from Charles and the Chocolate Factory, where everybody has a chance, not just people that are spending two thousand dollars on a box of Definitive or something ridiculous. Or I, I even mean just in terms of timing. Like, are they going to put it in regular Tops Chrome? The guys that didn't make this year's cut, but will make it before next year. I would be totally cool with that. The ones that were the year prior being Topps Chrome, and then people that debuted early in the year in Topps Chrome update. I'd be cool with that. Yeah. Ah, interesting. Might not have to wait quite as long if they. Did I would that. be. I would be shocked because like there's really no other reason to buy Topps Chrome update if it weren't for these. Yeah. If it weren't for these patches, so they would be smart to wait. But yeah, as we talk about this, we're using the phrase like we're putting a lot of faith in Topps. I think Phil said, and uh, that sort of echoed around in my head, and now it has me nervous. Like I, I am concerned that next year we'll get like. Patches on the sleeve, patches on the sock, patch on the pants, patch on the hat, and it'll be numbered out of five or something. And that, <laughs> would, that would definitely NASCAR you know, style some of the coolness. So hopefully, Tops can just keep this. I don't care if they have 120 people on the checklist. That that doesn't bother me. But it needs would, to be just one. Would you be cool if Tops bought the entire jersey of a specific player and they had out of 99, uh, and then just the one one of one still, but they had some nasty patches out of five? Like, would you be cool with that? Or and they didn't have some non-autograph versions for the ones that are numbered higher, or would that take away the allure of this one as well to you? Hmm, that's a good question. Because I could see that happening, and I don't think that's that crazy to say. Because no one's gonna really want this jersey if part of it's missing. Maybe they will. It's still a valuable product to have for someone, but just my thoughts. They they um fanatics will take advantage of their stronger relationship with the leagues than you Tops ever so. had because of the whole profit sharing agreement as well. Because of the connections that um, Mr. Man at the top has, um, it'll be interesting to, to see uh, what else they come up with. Because this is definitely not the last thing. It might not even be the last thing for this year. Who knows? Um, and of course, we know that the Tom Brady is coming, or we believe it's coming in, uh, in Bowman oh draft. God. But I think the Babe Ruth ca cards have really come down one of ones. Not to go down yeah. a tangent, but yeah, I I think if they lean in more towards this sort of thing tying a card to a specific game, a specific moment, I think that'll really help. I mean, maybe we'll get an opening day series where you can get patches or cards from opening day performances that are specifically photo matched, the pictures from that day, the patches from that day. I think things like that would really be enticing to collectors. So I hope they go more that route than sort of the, the Babe Ruth route. 
That would be a cool idea for the regular Tops Chrome release to do op uh, opening day patches for like, you know, the 50 biggest stars in the league. Yeah. That would be cool. I just think it's it's very funny that the same company that gives us this, this perfectly executed card with a great idea, also gave us the first stitch inserts from uh, from Tops Update. This is kind of funny. Like, were they in the same room when they were spitballing these ideas? Hey, spitball and shout out to spitball and cards. Make sure you like and subscribe. But probably, Chris, in all reality. Okay. <laughs> probably they probably probably was the same meeting and they thought they hit two home runs yeah oh for sure um so we want to wrap it up a little bit earlier since there's less of us we don't want to make you listen to our thoughts for way too long but i know chris you mentioned that you had a shout out that you wanted to give a card that you saw this week was cool do you want to share your screen and we can look at that or do you want me just to show my screen and we can look um, at it? you can just show your screen that'll be a lot easier than watching me flail helplessly um so on instagram there's an account uh, the username is a v cards um, and he has one of my absolute dream Acuna cards was his last post. It is the 2019 Topps Chrome Image Variation Red Refractor. Ooh. So it's that picture of Acuna down on one knee. Yeah. And it's red. It's number to five. And Ooh, yeah. I tell you, this card absolutely raises my body temperature. This thing, this this card is is very, very special. As soon as he posted it, like I happen to know this person a little bit. Jeff and I actually played softball against him uh, hmm. a few months ago. So I sent him a message. And he said like he's had it for a little while, but he didn't want to post it because he was afraid I would just be trying to get it from him nonstop. Which <laughs> I, that's a legitimate concern. And I, I've, I've already begun pestering him, but he's got it under lock and key. That thing is just an absolutely tremendous card. It is a cool yeah. card. It is. Do you know this image? Can you trace it back to a moment in the game? You know? I, I do not know where it comes from now, but I, so, I'm not sure that can be found out. Lately, I've been doing this thing with my PC players. You know who they are. I don't need to mention their names, but I a few of them haven't played very long, and they didn't play very long, like only like five or ten years. So I was able to look at their super fractors or their top chrome image and go in and actually find the moment that it happened from. So if this is a home run. I think it makes the card even cooler, right? I mean, I'm just looking at his eye line match, and I'm just going to assume it's a home run. But if it was like a fly out, I think it takes away from it. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just reaching here, but just a thought. Looks like yeah. a great card though. Yes. No, that card is really close. One of my I did a video of like the top five Acuna images out there. I had this one at number one. I think it's one of his that's one of his wow. best looking cards. Well, that's great. Well, everybody, thank you for listening to our podcast YouTube channel mix today. We appreciate it. Make sure you like and subscribe if you're on YouTube. If you are on Spotify, thank you. I don't know what you can do there, but I appreciate you listening. And we are on Instagram as well with Spitballing Cards as the same name. Feel free to send us a DM and we'll always do our best to respond. Other than that, we will catch you all in the next episode.